Okay, I think I've already uh, told you what we're looking at. I think more specifically, we oh, mentioned that we're going to be looking at the Mayan calendar, and uh, we, we certainly are going to do that. But uh, I, I think you probably heard in my prayer, I'd like to enlarge this to any of these particular end of the world scenarios and what exactly we should think about these things that um, uh, threaten our existence, that threaten to destroy the world. And I thought perhaps we could uh, break open this subject by simply um, thinking of some of the things that we've already lived through uh, or things that we're aware of where people thought the world was going to end. Does anybody have any um, that are fresh in their minds, Kathy? Okay, Harold Camping's predictions of, uh, let's see, that was uh, the end of the world in October, was it October of last year, wasn't it? Uh, it was even earlier than that. Right, uh, second coming of Christ, destruction of the world, ended up being a spiritual coming, and, and uh, people were still here, and uh, in the end, we're, going, we're all going to be destroyed in October of last year, but it um, didn't happen, yes? World War II. World War II? Okay. Imagine a lot of people were looking for a second coming during that time frame as well. And then, uh, well, of course, there's, yes. So World War II, any others you can think of? Any other? Really? Okay. Should have consulted that, but instead just consulted memory. Denise, did you have your hand up? World War I, right, uh, especially wars that engage the uh, majority of the world. Did, yes? I suppose that's true, yes. I think, um, and his second coming ended up being a spiritual second coming as well. Jerry? Oh, yeah. Dis dispensationalism predicts the end of the world. Um, if you happen to be in a dispensational church back in the uh, 70s, uh, they uh, believe that the, um, uh, the, the, fig, the fig tree putting forth its leaves that uh, Jesus um, uh, speaks of in, uh, you know, in the Gospels, I forget exactly where this particular instance is, but uh, they believe that to be uh, a picture of the rebirth of Israel at the end in the last days, and um, when Jesus says this generation will not pass away until all these things take place, so that must place it in Matthew 24 where the fig tree is. Um, uh, will not pass away until all these things take place. They say 40 years as a generation, so uh, 1948 is when the is Israel retook their land and became a nation again. You go 40 years later, that's 1988. Here we are living in the 70s at, at that particular time. You back up seven years for the uh, tribulation period and you've got 1981. And so you're looking for the Lord and you're kind of hustling, trying to get done the things you're hoping to get done while you're still here in the world. But yeah, that was another end of the world scenario. Yes. Y2K? That's right, Y2K. That's another one that I think most of us live through. And if you... Um, were around people that were getting somewhat excited about that. Uh, they believed there was going to be a, a global meltdown because all of our financial records were going to be lost and everything was going to begin to malfunction. We were going to go back into the Stone Ages as far as uh, electronics was concerned and because everything was going to shut down as far as agriculture and trucking, there wasn't going to be enough food and people were going to begin to riot and so we needed to store up food and weapons and so forth. And the year 2000 rolls around and sunrises and sunsets and nothing happened. Of course, there was some work that went into making sure that took place, but again, right? Yeah, there's been predictions of Christ's return throughout history. Anything else that you can think of that's threatened the world? I mean, haven't you... Don't you, um, you know, know people who have their ear to the ground on this and, and they hear about something and somebody says, well, this, this could actually get out of hand. This could bring about the end of the world. Uh, I think of one instance where um, 
someone was concerned about these mites that were killing bees. Yeah. Well, I won't mention names, but anyway, the, uh, but the idea is, I mean, it could have been a real threat. You know, these mites were killing bees, and if bees don't actually pollinate the, the trees and, and plants and so forth, we're not going to get uh, you know, produce. That could, be a that, that could be a problem, yeah. And, I mean, sure, it was a problem, but whether it was an end of the world uh, type scenario. The whole climate change. Global warming and all that. Yeah. That's right, global warming is going to kill us all as well. How about uh, those that lived through the Cold War? Was there any concern there? Cuban Missile Crisis. Harbingers of, of evil. Uh -huh. What about the fact that North Korea is uh, developing nuclear weapons? Does that create any consternation on anyone's part? Yeah, it should. Now, you know, we're not saying these things aren't concerns, but the question is, is it the end of the world? Uh, Iran, I believe, is also beginning to develop nuclear weapons. They want to you know, play with the big boys, I guess, on the, on the mainstream of politics and so forth. Um, anything religious-oriented besides the ones we've already talked about? Any enemies of Christianity that might... Uh, No, I haven't. No. Okay, well, we're going we're gonna to look at the Mayan calendar. That's actually where we want to end up with this regard. But just a couple of others, uh, anything biological you can think of? Plagues. Plagues, plagues yeah. Or can you think of any plagues that, that seem potential? AIDS. AIDS? Black plague. Yeah. Uh, black, black plague, did you say? I guess uh, there have been some modern cases of uh, bubonic plague. Anthrax. Anthrax, well, yeah. We're, and that was related to a particular uh, religious threat, wasn't it? Flu. That's right, the avian, avian flu. That wasn't too long ago. Thought it might uh, wipe out everybody, or at least a huge por portion of the population. What about Ebola? There's always that concern whenever it pops up out of the ground and so many people die. I think there's a concern about the SARS virus right now. Um, I think that's in the Middle East and so forth. Okay, and of course everybody's wondering whether the economy is going to continue to go down, down the tubes and if it does, if the economy breaks down and so many people out of work, again, you could have looting, rioting, and destruction of societies, we know it, and so forth. <laughs> okay, but, but the fact is uh, these things are always coming up, aren't they? Uh, I don't think this is anything new, and Brian just told us there's a whole list of these things going way back in, in, you know, in history, uh, end of the world scenarios. Well, as you know, uh, the Mayan calendar is really no different in that regard, is it? Uh, people think that the world is going to end uh, because of the Mayan calendar and so forth. So I thought what we'd do for a few minutes is um, just consider some things uh, regarding the Mayan calendar, what it is and uh, why it is people are concerned about it. <laughs> and then we'll, we'll come back and, and we'll say, so what? You know, does this, does this really matter? So what about the Mayan calendar? First of all, what is the Mayan calendar? Does anybody have any idea? The calendar of the Mayans? <laughs> that's, that's right, okay. Do you know that the Mayan calendar is still in use? Apparently some modern cultures use it. Have to be somewhat backward, I would imagine, but... Uh, this is, um, this is what at least one person says with regard to defining it. The, the Maya calendar is a system of calendars used in pre-Columbian Mesoamerica and in many modern communities. The essentials of the Maya calendar are based upon a system which has been in common use throughout the region dating back to at least the 5th century BC. It shares many aspects with calendars employed by other earlier Meso see, uh, Mesoamerican civilizations, such as the Zabatec and Olmec, and contemporary or later ones, such as Mi Mixtec and Aztec calendars. 
Although the Mesoamerican calendar did not originate with the Maya, their subsequent extensions and refinements of it were the most sophisticated. Along with those of the Aztecs, the Maya calendars are the best documented and most completely understood. I guess there's also a tradition that says that uh, it's documented in colonial uh, Yucatec counts, reconstructed from late classic and post-classic inscriptions, the deity Itzamna is frequently credited with bringing the knowledge of the calendar system to the ancestral Maya, along with writing in general and other foundational aspects of Maya culture. So basically, it's, it is the calendar that the Mayans use, but I guess it's um, something not only that they use, but um, others, but it was the best understood of all the calendar systems that existed, and it's apparently still used in some places today. Now, why is there a concern with the Mayan calendar? What, what is the concern? Okay, and why do they believe something cataclysmic is going to happen? Well, now that's that's an interesting observation. <laughs> Donna? The calendar? Yes, the calendar comes to an end. Okay. There's no dates beyond December the 21st on the Mayan calendar, supposedly. All right, uh, here's one article that talks about it. It's called the Mayan calendar discovery confirms 2012 end dates. And this is dated June 29th, 2012. Uh, Rosella Lorenzi writes, an ancient Maya text has emerged from the jungles of Guatemala, confirming, uh, excuse me, confirming the so-called end date of the Maya calendar, December the 21st, 2012. Now, uh, as Brian just mentioned, uh, the, the fact that the calendar ends has brought about some speculation. Why does it end? Does, do the Mayans actually explain why it ends? No, they, they don't. It's just that this particular calendar doesn't have any projected dates beyond 2012. And by the way, that also, in, in 2009, there was a, a, an article written by somebody by the name of Ray Villard who um, said that because of the ending of this um, calendar, uh, they, there were 10 uh, theories, doomsday theories, uh, what was going to happen when we reached that date. And actually, the alignment of the planets wasn't one of them, but it should have been. But there's others. Um, they had actually 10, starting from 10 all the way to 1. Uh, these are the things that were proposed. Changes in the sun's magnetic field will lead to powerful flares. In other words, a great uh, solar flare would uh, engulf the planet and uh, burn it up. Uh, the Earth's magnetic field will reverse. Now, in each of these cases, he doesn't actually explain why that would be catastrophic. I do know that um, I think there has been some uh, scientific evidence of the fact that perhaps that magnetic field has reversed before. The Earth's rotation axis will tip. Um, the particular author, uh, uh, author of this article believed that for something like that to happen, we would basically have to be rammed by uh, uh, Mars, uh, uh, that uh, the moon actually, uh, and I'd never heard this before, but the moon in its orbit is actually what helps keep the Earth tilted at its, at its axis. Okay. A grand alignment of Jupiter and Saturn, not all the planets, but at least these two big ones, will gravitationally perturb Earth. Uh, the sun will align with the galactic equator on the winter solstice. <laughs> he said, <laughs> he looked at that and he said, uh, so what? It's not really going to make any difference. Uh, the black hole in the galactic center will affect us. An asteroid will smash into the earth. By the way, uh, I see some motifs from some science fiction here. <laughs> the rogue planet Nibiru will swing by earth. Uh, that one, he said, turned out just to be a spot on a on a, a picture that, that really wasn't a planet after all. <laughs> As a matter of fact, he did bring that up, uh, Naboo and so forth. Uh, supernova, or actually supernovae, or hypernovae will irradiate the Earth. A cloud of negative energy will engulf the solar system. So anyway, these are the speculations of why the Earth will be destroyed because the Mayan calendar actually comes to an end on December the 21st, uh, 2012. Now, it is interesting uh, what 
the world believes regarding this. And uh, this, here's an article entitled 2012 Doomsday Poll Brings Out the Believers, dated May the 4th, 2012. A man by the name of Ian O'Neill writes this. He says, last night, Jay Leno cracked a joke on The Tonight Show that oddly generated few laughs. Commenting on TV shopping channels and the idea that you are more likely to be persuaded to buy junk late at night, Leno said, I bought a 2013 Mayan calendar. I feel like such a moron. <laughs> the audience's reaction, which he said brought forth few laughs, uh, could be interpreted one of two ways. They were either fatigued of the Mayan doomsday nonsense, one would hope, or a large part of the 22% of the American public who actually believe the world is going to end in their lifetime attended Lino's show. Or the joke wasn't that funny. Sorry, Jay. According to an international poll carried out by Ipsos Global Public Affairs on behalf of Reuters News, 22% of Americans believe, 22%, that they will experience some kind of Armageddon in their lifetime. When asked specifically about the idiotic notion that an ancient Mesoamerican calendar can foretell doom, 12% of Americans agreed with the statement. The Mayan calendar, which some say ends in 2012, marks the end of the world. So 12% of Americans agree. At least it's a little more than 10. What's that? One in every eight. And 22%, which would be, well, a little bit more than one in every five, believe that something is gonna happen in their lifetime that's gonna end the world. But it's okay, America, you're not alone. One in 10, 10% respondents in 21 countries agree. The Mayan calendar, which some say ends in 2012, marks the end of the world. 2% strongly agree, 8% somewhat agree. The majority of the world's citizens, 90%, however, disagree with this interpretation. 79%, or excuse me, 73% strongly, 16% somewhat. Two in 10, 20% of those in China, are in agreement, in agreement with the statement. Followed at the top of the global list by 13% in each of Turkey, Russia, Mexico, South Korea, and Japan. Only 4% in Germany and Indonesia seem to believe the prophecy joined by 7% in Great Britain, South Africa, and Italy. Of course, uh, obviously, they did poll everybody in the world. And this is based on 16,262 adults in 21 countries. Does this survey really indicate some kind of thriving doomsday? at least is what the question is to be asked. Now, one thing that I think is interesting, and, and this I think you should point to the people that you know to, at least with regard to the Mayan calendar in particular, is that the Mayans did not believe that that was going to signal the end of the world. That's not the reason why the calendar actually ended. As a matter of fact, they, they know why it ended. Let me give you some, um, some uh, data here. Again, Lorenzi, speaking of the Mayan text from Guatemala, writes this. Considered one of the most significant hieroglyphic finds in decades, the 1,300-year-old inscription contains only the second known reference to the end date, but does not predict doomsday. The text talks about ancient political history rather than prophecy. Marcelo A. Canuto, director of uh, Tulane University's Middle American Research Institute, said... According to the archaeologists, the 2012 reference would have been a political move by the, uh, see, Kalakmul king, who wanted to reassure the peoples of La Corona after the stunning defeat. The key to understanding the reference to 2012 is a unique title that the king gave himself, said the archaeologists. In the text, he calls himself the 13th uh, Ka'atun lord, the king who presided over and celebrated an important Mayan calendar ending. 13 Ka'atun calendar cycle in the year 692. In order to vaunt himself even further and place his reign into an eternal setting, the Maya king connected himself forward in time to when the next higher period of the Maya calendar would reach the same 13 number, December the 21st, 2012. So basically, uh, the, um, these, this particular line of thinking is saying this, that the calendar actually ended on this date because this king was making a political maneuver to uh, heighten uh, the people's appreciation of his reign and uh, his, his uh, you might say, his reputation. Now, here's another interesting question. Does the calendar actually end 
Because the answer to that is uh, it actually doesn't end. And they found archaeological evidence to that effect as well. There are many Mayan calendars that have been found that go much further than uh, December the 21st, 2012. In an article entitled, Oldest Mayan Calendar Found, and it goes way beyond December. This is where the article actually uh, gets the date right in the article, but, but gets it wrong in the title. Goes way beyond December the 12th, 2012. And this is dated May the 11th, 2012, by Stephanie Pappas. She writes this, the oldest known version of the ancient Maya calendar has been discovered adorning a lavishly painted wall in the ruins of a city deep in the Guatemalan rainforest. The hieroglyphics painted in black and red along with a colorful mural of a king and his mysterious attendants seem to have been a sort of handy reference chart for court scribes in 8800, the astronomers and mathematicians of their day. Contrary to popular myth, this calendar isn't a countdown to the end of the world. In December of 2012, the study researchers said, the Mayan calendar is going to keep going for billions, trillions, octillions of years into the future, said archaeologist David Stewart of the University of Texas who worked to decipher the glyphs. Numbers we can't even wrap our heads around. The Maya recorded time in a series of cycles, including 400-year chunks called baktuns. It's these baktuns that have led to rumors of an end of the world catastrophe on December the 21st, 2012. On that day, a cycle of 13 baktuns will be complete. But the idea that this means the end of the world is a misconception, Stewart said. In fact, Maya experts have known for a long time that the calendar doesn't end after the 13th baktun. It simply begins a new cycle, and the calendar encompasses much larger units than the Bactoon. So the thing is, I mean, um, we asked the question, should we be concerned that the Mayan calendar actually comes to an end? Well, the answer is the Mayans themselves were actually concerned about it. Um, they knew that it was a political maneuver. They knew that this man, this one particular king, was attaching his reign to the end of this particular cycle. And he says the significance of the fact that it ends on that particular day just simply means that that is the 13th group of 400 years that it comes to an end on that particular date. That's the way the Mayans looked at it. They weren't actually trying to predict the end of the world. So it doesn't really, um, <laughs> doesn't really matter. And when you uh, ask yourself the question, would the Lord have uh, revealed the end of the world to this pagan society of people to begin with and not reveal it to his people? his own people. I mean, what would the answer to that question be? Uh, there is a significant passage of scripture in Amos 3, verse 7. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. And obviously these prophets only existed within Israel. And I guess you might say that was true um, even in the writing of the New Testament. I believe, um, unless, uh, of course, Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke and Acts, um, was, I, I, I think I understand he was a Gentile. Maybe I'm mistaken on that. At any rate, it um, doesn't really matter. These were the prophets of the Lord, the Old Testament prophets, the New Testament prophets and apostles, and there were really none outside of that, although uh, perhaps some might disagree with us on that today. Uh, the Lord would not bring about the end of the world without telling us about it uh, first, and certainly if it were connected to some um, pagan calendar. I think, um, obviously, um, that wouldn't happen to begin with, but um, the Lord would have told us if that were the case. Now, let's just back up for a second and think <clears throat> about the Mayan calendar, but let's also think, hello, let's also think about any end of the world scenario. Should those kinds of things really concern us? Should an end of the world scenario concern us? We just, um, just by way of a brief review, we, um, uh, we considered some of the uh, things that people have looked at over the years with regard to uh, the end of the world, you know, World War II, uh, Cold War, uh, various viruses, AIDS, Ebola, and so forth. Um, as people look at that and, and believe that uh, the world is going to come to an end. Plague is going to spread to everyone. Economic meltdown, Y2K, um, 
world war that was going to end in someday nuclear holocaust and so forth. And yet the world didn't end. And then the Mayan calendar, uh, which the Mayans themselves did not see as ending. Uh, we just actually read um, some evidence of the fact that uh, all, all, the, uh, all that means is that this particular king who connected his reign to the end of this uh, uh, time frame called the Bakhtun, which is a 400 year period, it's at the end of these 13 of these time frames, uh, was just a political maneuver on his part. That's the reason why it ended. And they've also found um, evidence that the calendar actually never does end. It, it actually goes billions, or they say billions, trillions, and even octillions of years into the future. It never ends, the calendar that they have. So anyway, what are, we, what are we to think about these things? Should we ever be concerned when we hear about these things? What do you think? No? Shouldn't be concerned about the B-mites, Y2K, Ebola, AIDS. Should we be concerned at all about them? Greg? Well, at one level, we should be concerned because they do provide us with a great opportunity for evangelism. <coughs> okay. So we should be concerned to equip ourselves with uh, the reason for the hope that we have that means that even if it was the end of things as we know them, which we know them as feet by fire, um, that would be the beginning of. So not B mites, but nuclear holocaust. <laughs> okay, it does, we should be concerned, or we should at least be interested because it does offer us opportunity to be able to share the gospel. I mean, there's, we saw that 22% uh, of people who have been pulled, Americans at least, believe in uh, some type of an end of the world scenario in their lifetime. They think it's going to happen. Something's gonna happen. And about, uh, was it about 12%, I think, believe that the Mayan calendar is true and that the world's going to end December the 21st, 2012. So we, we are actually, as we look at the end, we'll probably go through a couple weeks here, but as we look at the end of this, we are going to want to consider how we might be able to take advantage of people's concern. Uh, one thing that uh, Jonathan Edwards pointed out with regard to the doctrine of hell is if somebody believes the Bible, uh, that is going to generate concern. And that concern is going to get them moving in the right direction. Uh, it's going to get them moving towards the Lord. And these kinds of things can create a similar concern. If you think you're going to die, then you're going to begin to take steps to um, get ready for that, right? When, when somebody comes down with a terminal illness, or if they even think that they have a terminal illness, first thing they begin thinking about is, am I ready to die? So anything that might threaten their lives will certainly open that door. So we will be looking at that. But I'm thinking now in terms of when we hear about the B-mites, when we hear about Ebola, when we hear about um, you know, the, um, you know, uh, Islam wanting to create a nuclear bomb or a, uh, to um, uh, mail anthrax the way that you know, happened during this whole thing or hijack more planes and fly them into buildings or whatever it may be, should we be concerned that the, the end of the world is coming. Jerry. Uh, there is an end of the world coming. God tells us in his word. That's right. When the end of the world is. And it's such a sudden and great judgment. Okay. And the only God can do it. And it's a prophecy. Nothing is going to prevent that from happening. So until then, there can't be an end. And it's a great opportunity to witness that. That's right. <clears throat> the world is going to end, but it's not going to end in that way. So whenever these kinds of things happen, we don't really have to be concerned. I mean, God has a plan. Now, we, we do want to get into um, basically what the Bible says about the end of the world, you know, when it's going to end. Because really, as, as I just mentioned before, I'm not sure if you were here when I mentioned, but um, in Amos 3, 7, the Lord says through Amos to his people, surely the Lord God does nothing unless he first, he reveals, excuse me, unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. So the Lord, 
who is in absolute control of when the world is going to end, is not going to do anything unless he actually reveals it first. The prophets, of course, have already written down everything that the Lord has revealed for us, so the Bible must contain uh, some reference to the end of the world, at least what the Lord wants us to know about it. And how is the world going to end? And what's going to bring about the end of the world? Is, is, does the Bible say that everything's going to go up in flames before uh, the Lord returns? Okay, after he returns, but not before. Ty, do you want to know what you're going to say? Okay. Right. Yes, we're actually going to get to that, you know, at, at the uh, at the last lesson. But again, if if the Bible tells us that the world's going to be brought to an end by Christ's second coming, then we we know that it's not going to end in some other way except that, right? Now, how do we know when that's going to take place? Does the Bible say anything about that? Right? Well, not that I was necessarily aiming at that, but um, that is something we have to take into account, right? Because we cannot know the day or the hour of his coming. However, well, depending upon how deep we want to get into this um, and how many have actually were here for the um, study in eschatology, uh, that may really have had no reference to the second coming. It's possible that Jesus was talking about 70 AD when he said that. But... Even so, he hasn't given us anything definite regarding uh, the second coming, has he, uh, on either scenario? Okay. <clears throat> but has he told us anything? Yeah. Okay, what, what has he told us? Well, it's almost imminent for me to get to the, the crowd and have Christ's ascension. The seed of the right hand of Father is still all the enemy of the Christ. So we know that all the enemy of Christ have to submit. Okay, there's one very important time indicator because the last enemy that is going to be subdued is death and that's going to be subdued at his second coming. So for those that aren't familiar with that particular reference, uh, when Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father, the promise is given to him that he must reign until all his enemies are subdued under his feet. Actually, we, we could take a look at that if you'd like, 1 Corinthians 15. I thought we would um, actually look at it from a, a slightly different angle, but it's still quite similar. Something else is going to happen. At the same time all his enemies are subdued, something else is also going to happen that's going to trigger the second coming. But uh, if you look at 1 Corinthians 15, verses 25 and 26, it's talking about the reign of Christ, which is not a future reign during a millennial period in a thousand years after tribulation. But it's talking about the reign that, that he is now engaged in. Uh, when he ascended into heaven, what does the Bible say happened to him? Where, where did he go from there? When, he's, okay, when, he, when he ascended to heaven, he was seated at the right hand of the Father. Uh, waiting from that time onward, actually the author to the Hebrews says, and maybe that would be a, a better place to uh, begin. Find this really quickly. It's in Hebrews chapter 10. Because there, there's a question as to when Jesus' reign begins. Um, actually, at least within the church there is. There isn't so much of a question, I think, in our minds. I believe everyone uh, who is in the quote-unquote reformed camp believe that Jesus is now uh, reigning. But if you look at Hebrews 10, verses 12 and 13, it says, But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, 
waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. So he is currently seated at the right hand of God, which is the place of honor and the place of authority. And he is, in fact, ruling and reigning. That's what um, actually 1 Corinthians 15 tells us. So let's jump back over to there. If we start back in verse 20, it does talk about the resurrection of Christ. And then um, it does begin to talk about his coming. Uh, let's see. Let's just back up to verse 20. But now Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits. After that, those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end, when he delivers up the kingdom to the God and Father when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. So the, basically the, the um, scenario is this. Christ makes his sacrifice, dies on the cross, he's buried, he's raised again, he's on the earth for 40 days, and that, at the end of 40 days he ascends. When he ascends, he sits at the right hand of the Father, he takes up his reign, and he is ruling and reigning right now over all of creation. Now he is, while he is reigning, the Father has made Jesus a promise. For the work that he has done, God the Father has promised to subdue all of Christ's enemies under his feet. Now he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet, and we're also told what the last enemy is. And if we look at the later part of the chapter, uh, when Christ comes again, that is when he will vanquish the last enemy, which is death. Um, Paul is arguing in verses 50 and following. Now I say this, brethren, the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall all, or we sh excuse me, and we shall be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? So he's reigning until all his enemies are subdued under his feet. The last enemy that is subdued is death. That enemy is subdued when he comes again to raise the dead and translate the living. So basically, we ask the question, can Christ come tonight? Well, can he come tonight? Why not? Well, unless he comes in one fell swoop and actually defeats all of his enemies in, in one moment or perhaps in a few moments before uh, the last one, the answer would be no. He can't return to vanquish the last enemy because that's the reason why he is returning, to vanquish the last enemy, which is death. He won't do that until all the other enemies are subdued. Is that, is that clear from this part? Does that make sense? Understand? So now if, if the world, if all of Christ's enemies were subdued, then we might expect him any time. But that hasn't taken place. Now, if you have a different understanding of that passage, I welcome uh, you know, to hear what it might be. But I really, I think I told you when, when I was um, uh, being examined for ordination uh, some 19 years ago, there was one member of the credentials committee asked me that, uh, asked me the question of my millennial perspective, and I said, well, I was all mill. And uh, he said, what do you think about the post mill position? And I said, I, I don't think there's anything in scripture that actually teaches that. And at that point, he kind of startled and almost fell off his chair because I would say something like that, where in his estimation, there was a great deal of, of information. Well, he pointed me to this verse. And I, I read it several times. I, I thought about it. I thought, yeah, that's, um, hmm, don't know what to do about that. Um, but I'm sure there's some way to resolve it into my view so that it'll fit, you know, where I'm already at. 
Uh, but um, after a while, I, I couldn't fit it into my view. It, it's something that um, I believe is, is quite um, clear. Christ isn't going to come until all the other enemies are subdued and the last enemy is death. So he must reign until he's put all his enemies under his feet. Now, it is possible, I suppose, that, and this is something we're going to want to look at, is he going to subdue them all tonight and make sure he vanquishes all of them before he raises the dead? That's, that's a possibility, I think. But uh, we'll, we'll look at some other things that, that indicate that perhaps that isn't going to be the case. Well, not necessarily if, um, if you follow what Paul says in verses 50 and following to 1 Corinthians 15, he does say, uh, I tell you a mystery in verse 51, we shall not all sleep, which means we shall not all die, but we shall all be changed. Now, some have said that that transformation that takes place when Jesus returns, when he transforms our bodies and uh, basically raises us up to meet him in the clouds, that that is a kind of death in the sense that uh, we're no longer uh, living as we are on the, uh, on the earth. But on the other hand, we don't really have to experience the separation of soul and body, which is what death is. So in one sense, I'd say, I, I would say, no, we don't have to die. Okay. Yeah. Which would be encouraging for that generation of people who are going to be there when Christ returns. But even so, if, if we die before that time, even though it may not be a pleasant experience on this end, it will certainly be a pleasant experience on that end. Yeah. Will, will unbelievers... Are you saying will they actually sort of drop dead at that point or will they, will they be changed in this way? Oh, and thrown into the lake of fire? Yeah, that, that's certainly death. But, but we don't, I was assuming she meant Christians. But okay, but for non-Christians. Oh, okay. All right, so yes, but the, the unbelievers, uh, even if, because, you know, even though this text singles out Christians that are being changed, I don't doubt that, that, the, that the living unbelievers will also be changed at that point and brought before the tribunal, because that's the reason why everybody's being gathered together at one time, to be judged soul and body at one time before the throne. And um, so, but, but that what they're going to experience after the judgment, certainly the Bible calls death when they're cast into the lake of fire, the second death, the eternal death. Uh, but for the Christian that lives up to that point, the believer, he won't experience really any kind of death but um, those that live prior to that will. Well, we're out of time. I, wasn't, I was going to get into another argument as to when exactly Christ comes. We'll just save that for next time. But um, next time, what I would like to do is you know, look at some indicators in Scripture that perhaps the Lord's coming is not for a little while longer. And this was, this was one of them, depending upon how we interpret it. Uh, all of Christ's enemies being subdued under his feet, whether that happens in, in like a thunderclap at one time or whether it happens uh, more systematically or whether, you know, what we can actually tell from Scripture in that regard. And then the third week, we should probably talk about how we might make the best use of the Mayan calendar and other types of crises that uh, cause people to uh, begin to be concerned for their lives and how we might use that to our, to our advantage and to the Lord's advantage in bringing the gospel to them. Any questions on what we've uh, looked at this evening? Uh, 45 minutes sure went fast. Anything? Okay. All right. Then let's close with a word of prayer, and we'll take a few minutes to uh, move into the back.